Hello, welcome to another Coffee with Mr. IoT. My name is Robert Schmidt. I'm Deloitte's Chief IoT Technologist. And today we have a special guest. We have Chris Berquist. Uh, Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You are, you're many things, but um, I met you uh, working with a volunteer organization because of me flying drones in my spare time. I got invited to one of your stat meetings and you're one of the co-founders and I I'd call you the heart of the search tech advisory team or stat. Tell us a little bit about this. Um, what is it? And um, then I'm just going to go right into it because this all came out of a conversation when I asked you a question in one of our trainings. So go for it. Sure. Uh, and so our group uh, mainly works with volunteers within the community to assist in search and rescue efforts throughout the state of Hawaii. Um, and so what we found is lots of private citizens have lots of special skills and lots of little niche uh, things that they can bring to the table. And so we just try to cobble and manage that to a more productive end uh, for search and rescue. And what we've found is one of the big things that's generally lacking out here is good technology to assist with that thing, uh, that, that goal, whether it be GIS software, uh, real-time tracking, uh, the drones, the image analysis stuff with the drones, um, basic things just like communication. And so we provide all of that as much as we can to the existing search teams and to the volunteers that tend to show up for the searches. So let's talk a little bit about how that practically all works, right? Someone gets lost in Hawaii, some place they on a hike and they don't come home in time and um, they get lost. How do you, how do you, how do we help? I am kind of like a little part, I just started, but uh, I still have a long way to go, but how do you help people and how do, how do, when you say tech, what tech are we talking? I mean, I know I talked about drones, I talked about software, but to me, this was super, super interesting because you actually really bring tech to a very meaningful uh, use here. So tell us about this. How does this work? How do you, how do we come involved? How do you sure. Well, so to start with, you know, we use tech as a pretty broad term for any innovation that's helping us do the job a little better. Um, you know, something as simple as the harnesses that we hook the dogs up to in the helicopter, we consider a tech of types because it's not standard practice for people to have it. And it is an upgrade from a collar. Um, so, you know, technical innovation is something that we try to grab and cobble off the shelf and press towards, uh, the goal of search and rescue. And so somebody goes missing, say that you have a friend that goes missing. You know that they were out for a hike. They were due back uh, five o'clock this afternoon. It's dinner time. Nobody's heard from them. You may call the fire department um, or the police department. And if you know specifically where they were and that they were due back at a time, the fire department's going to be the one that takes measure there. And they'll usually launch the helicopter to go look for you. Uh, if you're in the urban scape and you're an adult, it's not illegal for an adult to go missing. So there's a lot of circumstantial things that come into whether or not you're going to be assisted by uh, public resources as a missing adult in the urban scape. Um, so we tend to focus more on the wilderness side of it, unless it's an adult with dementia or Alzheimer's or a child with uh, autism. And we get involved pretty quickly. Um, and so the state regulations have uh, state resources allocated to the problem for three days. And if there's no sign of life, no sign of struggle uh, within those three days, then the state has to pull their resources. That's just the, the process that they have. Every state has different time limits. Uh, California is like 10 days, but there are other states with a three-day time limit. It just depends on what resources they have available for it. Uh, and so once that, that 48 hour mark comes in and if they're starting to feel like there may not be a resolve by tomorrow, the family will often reach out to us uh, or has reached out to us within that first 48 hours. And we come in and start to communicate with fire and PD um, and get the soft handoff from them so that we have the most up-to-date information when they step out of the picture. And that way we uh, continue to keep them in the loop as things develop so that if we do need county resources again or state resources again, they're up to speed on what's going on. Uh, and so I generally step in as the search manager and I liaise between the family and all of the county and state resources. 
as well as organize the search plans for the civilians that are coming out. Um, and each of those teams, depending on how big the area is, sometimes we have 150 people volunteering at a search during a day, during a search period. Sometimes we have 10 people. Um, so if it's 150 people, we'll put them into groups of five to 10, depending on their skill sets and the areas we need them to search. And then we'll hook them up with whatever tech they need. So whether it be radios, uh, with a repeater out in the field, uh, some Garmin GPS trackers, so we can keep a live feed on where they are. Um, we'll hook them up with med kits, lights, cam lights, um, hiking sticks, climbing, climbing equipment, uh, things of that nature. Uh, we also in the past have been really heavy into the helicopter use, but now that we have the bigger drone with the extended flight time, uh, we can put sensors such as FLIR or just live feed camera up on the drone. And on that Matrice, we get almost an hour of flight time with it. On uh, the helicopter, you get two hours. And with the helicopter, you can have three people looking out. There is advantage to that. But as we talked about in that class, uh, the repeatability and the affordability of being able to put a drone up over and over and over again gives us a greater reach uh, as far as how often we can process an area. A helicopter can certainly go further than the drone can. Um, so we still use those when we need to. Um, What's the but, cost of a helicopter hour versus the hour of a drone? So the helicopter with the, the Good Samaritan discount that we get for doing what we do is still about 1600 bucks an hour. And then if we want to add a FLIR and FLIR operator to that, that adds another $600 an hour. So twenty one hundred dollars uh, an hour. What about the drone? The drone was thirty two thousand dollars once, and so you know if we can put that thing in the air for twenty four hours of field use, then we've paid for it uh, as far as helicopter trade off. It's funded on. Um, it's funded based on donations that came in, and there's really minimal cost. There is some cost to if there. There's some ongoing cost, but it's in the tens or twenty dollar range rather than in the two thousand dollar range. Correct. I was going to say now some of the bigger cost comes with the processing of that data. Uh, so we can go up and shoot lots of videos, shoot lots of photos. And just like that software we were playing with in the class, the locate, we have image scanning software. Uh, and then there's also other types of software out there. If we're doing an evidence search or assisting with a crime scene search, um, there's different software that you can use. Uh, there's things like looking glass that you can set yourself up with so that you can see the height of a fence or if a gate is open or if cars are in the driveway or if that property has a dog on it, uh, things like that. So before we're sending volunteers into specific areas, we can get a little bit of a better grasp on where we're asking them to go. Because we're often bouncing in between those interface areas between neighborhoods and wilderness. Mm -hmm. And so we're always playing the property boundary line and we're always trying to send our people somewhere relatively safe. Um, if I remember this right, there was um, when you take a picture, and this is similar to when you look down as a human from a helicopter, it takes us about seven minutes to process a full image. Is that what you said? If you take a picture as a human? And so, yeah, we call that squinting. And so in the search procedure, in the search process, we would ask the drone or the helicopter to fly a particular pattern. So we're capturing full imagery of the area. And then we have to go back and review all of those pictures. Um, and for one person to fully scan an image and then document whether or not they found something and allocate it to a file or an archive for later review, um, realistically takes between six and seven minutes per photo. If you're doing it well, uh, you and can certainly software. glance at a photo. What's that? Software can do three a second. Is that what I remember? Yeah, Locate can do, on a, on a good processing system, they can process three images per second that's looking for a single pixel of color. And so your naked eye can't detect that. Uh, so no matter how well you squint uh, at a photo, the, that processing software is going to beat you at the job. So this was sort of all new to me, and I just want to bring this back to, you have three people in a helicopter and you have a floor camera that you have to analyze the images again. But if you fly with a helicopter, there's three people looking down. You can't really see a pixel. And, but you, you know, I would say there's a certain amount of luck to have the right people look at the right, ang the right area at the right time to find something. When you fly with yeah. a drone, you take images, uh, live images, and I don't know how many images a second you take, but then they get processed through the software where you can process every Im three images in a second. And so there's a huge difference uh, in terms of seeing color changes and color differences that you would have on a drone. Would you say that flying with the drone 
you probably see things you couldn't see with a helicopter. However, you can rescue them right there and then, which is the big advantage of a helicopter, right? Correct. And so, you know, just because we see something on the drone, we still have to post process and then have a post action event um, where we're going to go out there and hope that 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 image is still in the same area, that target is still in the same area. Um, so if we're flying at night with thermal, that creates a big issue for that is sending people out into the night to, mit- to chase every every possible lead. Uh, we've sent teams out at night before to chase thermal images. And let me tell you, it's a gong show. Um, trying to organize a bunch of volunteers that haven't worked together and you're all running on adrenaline and heart because you're chasing this image of a person walking through the woods and you're looking for somebody. So, you know, as, as hard as you try to plan, all the plans go out the window as soon as, as soon as you step into the woods and you think you're on the right track. Uh, so you got to have a good, you know, it's got to be a good full picture. The drone is just a piece of that process. Uh, and I would call that an image scanning process overall, but to have that, you have to have the flight platform, the sensor, the processing software, the team available to reconnoiter if necessary. Um, uh, a lot of our volunteer teams go out with the stipulation that you are there to look, not to bring home. If you do find something, that's what we have insured and trained county professionals for. So this software, the drones, or that drone in this case for a stat and the software and the training and analyzing this, is that something police and fire have also, or do they search differently the first 72 hours? Um, so I actually met with the PD drone department guys uh, at a search that we did not too long ago out in HANA, and they have quite a fleet of hardware. They have a lot of different drones. Um, and I know that they have some different piloting software. They were interested in the locate stuff when I was talking about it. It didn't sound like they had something that really follows that uh, style of data processing or image processing. I think that they, uh, it sounds like they do more squinting or real-time viewing and less, less after-action review with that stuff. Um, granted, PD is not often using it for search and rescue. Uh, they're usually using it for officers, officer safety or uh, real-time pursuit of, uh, or surveillance of a property or something like that while they have a team moving into something. Um, fire department would be the ones that use it more for search and rescue. And to my knowledge, the fire department does not have a dedicated uh, drone team right now. They often call out the, the PD guys to come assist when necessary. I know you and I talked about this a little bit more, and I'm, I'm going to avoid getting political on YouTube, but um, this is obviously different by each department for you, right? And you spend a lot of time talking with individual departments, not just on Mali, but on the different islands and the different um, counties, you know, if you wish. <clears throat> and so this is almost a county per county conversation. Is that correct? Yes, very much so. And, and even, even within the county, a department by department conversation. Um, you know, every time that we do a search, we're usually only working with one or two detectives in a specific firehouse. They don't usually change off the, you know, different firehouses don't come in and work with you. So you get two or three captains you work with and one chief. Um, and you develop the relationship with that very small group of people. If you go across the island to work, uh, you're not going to have any of that hospitality that you've warmed yourself up with uh, on the previous search. Um, sometimes they do communicate across the board and I feel like they call and check in about us every once in a while, we get a little bit of cred check. Um, but for the most part, it's only once I've done a search with these guys before and they realize that we're pretty effective and well-organized, uh, that we start to get kind of more of a warm and fuzzy when we work with them. I, I want to say two things here. Number one, I, I work in tech my entire work life and tech is my passion. And when I met you and saw what you do, very impressive and very modern. So I invite anybody who is in this field, just come reach out to Chris and us, because I think there's some amazing things that we do, number one. And I know that you've been nothing but warm and helpful and really supportive. So that's one. Number two, I want to also say that um, I was impressed by how serious you take this in terms of not encroaching on people, not encroaching on officials, asking for permission. What do we do? What's the process? How do we document? I was like blown away. 
Um, so I, I want to just say this here too. It was really great to see how you go about this. And so um, thank you for doing this. And uh, we'll put at the end uh, a link to for people to donate to that. I want to go you. to a whole different area. This was a question I asked you, and I think we're getting a little into the heart part of this. A heart in terms of heart here, the heart that beats, and hard part in terms of H-A-R-D, the difficult one. Um, I asked you this question. What's the feeling when you find someone? That was the question I asked you when you sat there. And I sort of asked it very innocently. And then it got a really um, an interesting answer. So um, let's try to uh, go there a little bit. I, I'd love to hear from you. What is the feeling when you find someone? And just tell us what, what that really means, actually, because it's actually very interesting. I got to say there's a few different sides to it. Um, so you know, obviously finding someone alive, uh, is a very, I mean, it's powerful. You're giving somebody back their family. You're giving somebody back their friend or their husband or loved one or wife. Um, and that's just the rawest roller coaster of good emotion that I have ever experienced in my life. Um, we're actually hitting the two year anniversary of finding a girl alive, uh, this coming week, next week. Um, and it just, it calls back all of those cool goosebumpy moments. Um, you know, it's, it's the roller coaster of doubt. Every search is you go out, you fail, you go out, you fail, you go out, you fail, you go out, you fail. You have to keep doing that. And we don't look at it as failure, but you're going out to find somebody as a searcher and you're coming back with an area checked off, but you didn't find somebody. So emotionally that really starts to wear you out. Um, and so to find somebody alive. I mean, it just rips all of that away and replaces all of it with, you know, I'm not a very hippity dippity person, but it, it replaces it with all these big, bright, amazing things. Um, inversely, uh, you know, finding somebody who's no longer with us, somebody who's died, um, is it's a mixed bag because you're out there to search. You're out there to find somebody you've done your, your job, if you will, um, you've provided this service where you've given somebody an answer, given a family or friends an answer, but you also have to go back and tell them that that person is not coming home. Um, and we don't have a chaplain on board. We don't have psychologists with us or anything like that. It's just us out there as the search team telling a father, his little girl's not going to come home or a brother that his sister's not coming home or something like that. And, uh, I gotta say that's on the other side of it, the rawest human emotion that I've ever experienced or ever seen. I mean, just, uh, the depth of it, the, the pain that these people experience right then and there is just, there's nothing that's ever prepared me for that. Uh, so you do feel this sense of completion uh, in, in some debriefs, we even label it, uh, sort of a success. Um, but it doesn't feel like, uh, success if you will. Now, the, the deeper side of that is when you've searched and searched and searched and never found the person, that's a whole different kind of void of, uh, of success, non-success. You know, you've done a productive search. You feel like you've checked off all the boxes and been very thorough and they're still just not there. Um, that's a whole different emotional roller coaster. So, uh, but, but, uh, to full circle back to finding somebody, I'd say there's always this very, um, satisfaction of it because you've wrapped it all up and put a bow on it, if you will. Um, but sometimes it's also just opening an even bigger box. So you've gone from doubt and question until this known emptiness of them never coming home. Uh, it's one thing I found that when we're, when we're bringing back that news about somebody that's pick a number, say older than 40, 45 that information is handled very differently um, with the family and the friends when we're bringing back that information about somebody that's in their teens or early twenties. Uh, it's, it's very raw and it's, you know, it, it's just a terrible thing to witness. But at the same time, you know, that if we hadn't been out there doing our, our part and our volunteers hadn't been out there giving their time and their energy, that family may never have known. Um, so it's, you know, there, there is a satisfaction if, if you could, um, but it's not, it's not a sleep nice at night satisfaction. It's just, uh, it closes off some doubt. It's, it's interesting how you said <clears throat> 40 people react differently. I lost my very best friend when I was 19 mountain climbing. 
Uh, his name happened to be Robert too. Um, and I think it really grew me up in a big way. <laughs> it also told me that, uh, taught me, um, I will never forget to tell people when I love them anymore because um, I didn't. And he was my best friend and there were lots of good moments. But um, yeah, you grow up fast in those situations. It, it, it's interesting, right? Because you, you, you had really three scenarios that you talked about. Someone comes from life, alive, someone is found, but not alive. And then you don't find anything. And it's almost like in, in, in one and two, you create closure in, in both ways, right? And so it's the hardest probably in the third way you don't find. What I found so fascinating about when you talked was that you said, what's the percentage again of one and two versus three? Because I've heard that's actually really high. And I was super surprised after 72 days official searching, you still have like an 80% percent, percent uh, rate of finding someone? Yep. So within our group, we have a pretty good ratio. Um, nationally, the statistic is seven out of 10 people that are searched for are never found. But within our organization and our managed searches, um, it's more, it's leaning more towards 80% are found. Um, and I, I believe that just has to do with a lack of red tape um, and any red tape that there is, we tend to plow right through it. Uh, we tend to be a very solution or, uh, oriented group. Um, and I don't have a problem calling anybody to ask them for anything because generally with search and rescue, people want to, help, um, so they want to give you a yes. Uh, so we tend to push all the resources and call in a lot of different closets. Whereas when fire or PD take over a search, they're very limited in what they can use, um, how many people they can involve. Uh, how many resources they can involve, how much fuel they can burn, things like that. Uh, we don't have any of those hangups. And I don't mind working with civilian groups, military groups, private search groups, Boy Scouts, high school groups, whatever. I can find something useful for people to do. And for us to be able to constantly press the issue like that, um, I think is what has given us most of our results, is just thoroughness, essentially. Um, and really sticking to the basics and and covering the area beyond the reasonable section um you know we tend we, we tend to joke that we get all the hard ones you know if they could have been found in the first 72 hours county would have found them uh so it's it's only because they're hard to find that we're out there at all so when we do find somebody uh it, it does give that extra point of man it was a couple of untrained volunteers out here just putting in some heart and some good organization that achieved something that state uh, was unable to, uh, for one reason or another, I will say though, searching a lot of it is luck of the draw. It's whether or not you looked behind that tree when you were walking past, or you happen to choose to drop your rope in the rappel for that particular area or fly your drone over that three foot square patch that a helicopter has been over 20 times already. So it's nothing against the guys who have out there put in, putting in the, the prior effort. A lot of our searches are resolved from researching an area that's already been searched one or two or three or four times. Um, so having fresh eyes, fresh opinions, uh, things like that really do matter. Well, you said something interesting, right? You said sometimes people go out and don't want to be found. So yeah. that also is a big place for that. adds to that. So, but I, I just want to come back to, you know, stats, to, <clears throat> stats, statistic, pun intended, uh, <laughs> of 80%, um, finding people is amazing. I want to give you a lots of props. I've been, as I said, so impressed with what you do, but I, I want to give the last word to you. What's the thing you want people to take away from this and walk away with? What's something before we go and ask for anybody who wants to donate, we'll put a link on there, but I, I'm going to give you the closing word rather than me. And so I would say uh, if you're going to be a hiker in the wilderness or a participant in outdoor activities, uh, just know that your phone can take you a lot of places that maybe you're not so ready to go. Um, and I don't mean that to be discouraging. I just mean that in back in the day, if you will, um, you didn't find a secret waterfall or get to a steep ridge unless you had the experience to get you there. These trails that are on private property, and that's when they become isolated and stranded. Um, so if you are going to knowingly go to one of those places, I know it sounds cheesy, but make a plan and, and let somebody know when you expect to be back. Um, granted, most people that we respond to were out there alone. 
Uh, and those are not generally the type of people that are going to make a plan and leave it with somebody. Uh, you should always take your phone with you, even if you don't plan on using it. Uh, you can power it off. That's fine. But at least if you have it with you, we can try to ping it. Uh, that's a, a pretty commonplace tactic these days is if you're still receiving messages or sending messages or have any Google locate stuff working on your phone, we can usually actively ping your phone. Um, creepy. But uh, it also helps us find you or at least establish a uh, direction of travel uh, for folks. And then on the other side of all of that, if you feel like you're somebody that has the skills or the willingness to be a part of one of these organizations that goes out and helps people, uh, and you have some time or energy or expertise to lend, um, then please either reach out to us or even within your own community, find out what the volunteer search and rescue situation looks like. Uh, and make yourself a part of it. Some of them are very informal. We tend to be fairly informal. We don't train together on a regular basis. We do offer some classes here and there, um, but we realize that people are busy. And one of the reasons that a lot of organizations don't have a large standing member base is because people can't afford the time to come train and commit. Uh, and that's fine. I don't want that to discourage people from coming and helping when the time is necessary. So find out what's going on in your community and try to be a part of it. And if there's nothing going on in your community, it's not very hard to start something. Um, so those would be my final thoughts. Thank you for watching another Coffee with Mr. IoT. I, I can't find good words to close it except to say thank you to Chris and the team. And if you have it in your heart, please donate a little or a lot, whatever you can, and um, help someone else to get closure and or find their loved one. Thank you for watching.